Hi, everyone. Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to our uh, lecture series, The Ism and the Artist. Today, we're going to take a look at uh, pop art, which would be kind of fun for a dull January. Um, and then eventually that will lead to a, a greater look at Roy Lichtenstein. So let's get started. So what were the pop artists rejecting? So emerging in the uh, mid 50s in Britain and in the late 1950s in America, pop art reached its peak in the 1960s. It began as a revolt against the dominant approaches to art and culture and traditional uh, views on what it should be. So pop art is a direct descendant of Dadaism because it mocks the art world by using everyday motifs as subjects to create art. Now the Dadaists originated irrational ways of images uh, to provoke a reaction from the public. Um, their intention was to offend and to shock uh, common sense. Pop artists uh, adopted the same visual method, uh, but concentrated their interest on popular culture. While pop art and Dadaism explored some of the same subjects, pop art replaced the destructive, satirical, and anarchic um, impulses of the Dada movement with kind of this uh, detached information of these, again, the artifacts of mass culture. So really all about exploring what um, the, the objects of mass culture were. So pop art substituted the harsh, sarcastic and radical impulses of the Dada movement with an appreciation to popular culture. Pop artists wanted to express their optimism to a culture born during post-World War II who sought to acquire consumer goods in response to mass media advertising. So World War II has ended, we have all this new advertising coming in and all this, and this was kind of a, uh, a reaction to that and how do we, how do they um, empl employ this? So pop art did not critique the consumerists it simply recognized it as a natural fact of the times. So just kind of bringing consumerism into the art world. Now, in 1957, pop artist Richard Hamilton listed the characteristics of pop art in a letter to his friends. He said, pop art is popular, designed for a mass audience, transient, a short-term solution, expendable, easily forgotten, low cost, mass produced, aimed at the youth. It was also meant to be witty, sexy, gimmicky, glamorous, and big business. Now, modernist critics were actually horrified by the pop artist use of such low subject matter and apparently by their uncritical treatment of it. Um, in fact, pop art took uh, art into new areas of subject matter and developed new ways of presenting it in art and can really be seen as one of the first manifestations of postmodernism. And that's, that's kind of the idea. There was a book written by Arthur Danto called The End of Art. And it said really from the Renaissance up until the pop art movement, um, art had followed a, a nice trajectory, but this was really kind of the end of art because it went into such consumerism. Kind of interesting. Um, so we'll go back and take a look a little bit at the uh, British pop, which is really where the term pop um, originated from. Now, again, although they were inspired by similar subject matter, uh, British pop is seen from distinctive from American pop. Early pop in Britain was fueled by American popular culture, but viewed from a distance, while the American artists were inspired by what they saw and experienced living within that culture. In the United States, uh, pop style was a return to representational art, art that depicted the world in a recognizable way. Um, as opposed to abstract expressionism. So it's also a reaction against abstract expressionism. Um, by using impersonal, mundane imagery, pop artists also wanted to move away from the emphasis on personal feelings and personal symbolism that had kind of characterized abstract expressionism. So uh, when we had the Jackson Pollocks and he's throwing the paint on the floor, there was a lot of emotion thrown into that. And so that's, that's what they were trying to get rid of by using these commercial objects here. So in Britain, uh, the movement was more academic in its approach. While employing irony and parody, it focused more on what American popular imagery represented and its power in manipulating people's lifestyles. 
Now, the word pop was first coined in 1954 by the British art critic Lawrence Alloway to describe a new type of art that was inspired by the imagery of popular culture. Alloway, alongside the artists Richard Hamilton and Eduardo Paolozzi, was among the founding members of the independent group. And this was a collective of artists and architects and writers who were exploring um, radical approaches to contemporary visual culture. So right up Pop Alley. And they became the forerunners uh, to British pop art. Um, now this artwork that we're seeing here um, was illustrated um, through a, a, it was a whole series of collages that were taken from uh, American magazines that he received from GIs that were still in residence in Paris in the late 1940s. Um, so this was a real, and also one of the very first ones to actually include the word pop in it up there, which we can see. So literally showing us what pop art is. Now, some young British artists in the 1950s um, who grew up with the wartime austerity of uh, ration books and utility design viewed this seductive imagery of American popular culture and its consumer's lifestyle with this kind of romantic sense of irony and a little bit of envy. Uh, they saw America as being the land of the free, free from the crippling conventions of class um, and culture, uh, that it was also a more inclusive, youthful culture that embraced the social influence of mass media and mass production. And so this uh, collage here that we see as well as kind of this ultimate catalog of pop images. Um, we have comics and newspapers and advertising and cars and food and packaging and appliances and celebrity. Um, and so it's, it, it really just kind of in, embraces all of this consumerism that we're going to see. Oops, have to move on. There we go. So pop art in America evolved in a slightly different way to its British counterpart. American pop art was both a development and a reaction against abstract expressionist painting like we talked about before. Um, abstract expressionism was the, really the first American art movement to achieve global acclaim, um, but many felt it had become too introspective and um, also to uh, elitist uh, as well. So again, they were pouring their feelings into it and were saying that was really too much from that. So American pop art uh, evolved as an attempt to reverse this trend by reintroducing the image um, as, a, as a device in painting. And this was a model that had been tried and tested before. Uh, Picasso had done some of this when he had done his real world collages. Um, and because he was afraid that painting was becoming too abstract at that point. Um, and then we kind of had the, the bridge between abstract expressionism uh, and pop art was Jasper Johns, who we see here uh, doing the numbers and colors. And he also, we also know him for his uh, flags series as well. So again, using uh, these uh, uh, utilitarian and consumer images um, in his artwork. Uh, but uh, Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg were actually the forerunners of American pop art. And here's a look at uh, Rauschenberg's um, uh, uh, image here. And he was really interested in um, changing perception and the interpretation of images. Um, in this painting here, he kind of plays with the way that we have read paintings since the early Renaissance. So the composition, uh, strange as it seems, kind of recalls early religious icons where the central figure of a Christ or a saint would have been surrounded by smaller narrative panels. And so in this case, we have uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, who is our central figure, surrounded by these little vignettes um, you know, that kind of also is giving a warning we can see with his finger, but again, bringing in these very popular images um, that we were uh, so used to by this time of seeing. So we know this cultural revolution was underway after World War II. It was led by activists and thinkers and artists who sought to change um, and even overturn what in their eyes was this stifling social order that was riddled by conformity. So the Vietnam incited mass protests, the civil rights movement sought equality for African-Americans and the women's liberation movement gained momentum. And it was in this climate of turbulence, experimentation and increased consumerism that a new generation of artists emerged. 
and they began to look for inspiration and materials in their immediate environment. They made art that mirrored, uh, critiqued, and at times incorporated everyday items, consumer goods, mass media messaging, and imagery. And this, of course, was pop art. Uh, pop artists strove for straightforwardness in their work, using bold swaths of primary colors, often straight from the can or the tube. Um, they adopted commercial uh, advertising methods like silk screening. Um, they also produced multiples. Um, downplaying the artist hands and using that idea that it's, it is mass production, so you don't always need the artist's hands. And it, it, it really just kind of completely changed um, in the way that we had seen art before. So if there was one person who personified uh, pop, pop art, it was certainly Andy Warhol. Um, he originally worked as a commercial artist and his subject matter was derived from the imagery of mass culture, advertising, comics, newspaper, TV, and the movies. Now, Warhol really embodied the spirit of American popular culture and elevated its imagery uh, to the status of museum art. He used secondhand Im images of celebrities and consumer products, which he really had um, kind of had this banality that kind of made them more interesting. He felt that um, if they had been stripped of their meaning and emotional presence through their mass exposure, um, and this was really kind of a subversion of the typical um, art establishment. So really going against establishment here as really all artists were as, we went, as we've seen going along. So his approach really, this detached approach said, was always the same. And he said, I think every painting should be the same size and the same color so that they're all interchangeable and nobody thinks they have a better or worse painting. So kind of this egalitarian thing as well. But uh, Warhol saw this aesthetic of mass production as a reflection of contemporary American culture. He said, what's great about this country is that America started through tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same things as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola, and you know that the president drinks Coca-Cola, Liz Taylor drinks Coca-Cola, and just think, you can drink Coca-Cola too. A Coke is a Coke, and no amount of money can get you a better Coke than the one that the bum on the corner is drinking. All Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. Liz Taylor knows it, the president knows it, the bum knows it, and you know it. And uh, the obvious irony of this statement is that uh, the price of the Coke bottle uh, goes, gets ridiculously high the minute that Andy Warhol signs his name to it. So they're in the difference of his Coke bottles with everyone else. Um, and he also said, I started as a commercial artist and I want to finish as a business artist. Being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. So also wanted to make money, which is never a bad thing to wanna do. Now, Warhol was against the idea of skill and craftsmanship as a way of expressing the artist personality. So very different from what we, had, we have experienced before in art. Um, he claimed to have removed both craftsmanship and personality from his own art. The reason I am painting this way is that I want to be a machine, he said. I feel that whatever I do and do machine-like is what I want to do. If you want to know all about Andy Warhol, just look at the surface of my paintings and films and me. There I am. There's nothing behind it. So his works were really produced uh, through the mechanical processes of film and silk screen printing or made by others in his studio, which he actually called the factory. So kind of this such this interesting uh, uh, blend between uh, business and art here. So one of the other are, uh, big artists of um, pop art is Roy Lichtenstein. Um, he developed a pop art style that was based on the visual vernacular of mass communication. And that was the comic strip. Um, it was a style that was fixed in its format, black outlines, bold colors, and tones rendered by Bende dots. Um, this was a method of printing tones in comic books from the 1950s and 60s. Um, what actually changed through the development of Lichtenstein's art was his subject matter, which evolved from uh, comic strips to the exploration of modern artist styles. 
And we'll take a look at that when we take a look at uh, um, uh, Roy in, in our, our next lecture. Um, he actually remarked, uh, they said his comic strips images had an initial shock value, uh, but much like pop, they were quickly embraced by the galleries and collectors. Lichtenstein remarked, it was hard to get a painting that was despicable enough so that no one would hang it. Everybody was hanging everything. It was almost acceptable to hang a dripping painting rag, dripping paint rag, sorry. Everybody was accustomed to this. The one thing everyone hated was commercial art, but apparently they didn't hate that enough either. So just kind of this interesting reaction of, um, of almost trying to, again, change the art world. So this idea of the end of art as we knew it, like Renaissance and Baroque um, and classicism, neoclassicism and all that is really what they're trying to do is, is change the way we're looking at art. And it certainly did. So the hard edge commercial style of Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein's comic book paintings was really kind of, again, this um, antidote to the splashes of the abstract expressionist painting. Um, but it was not really intended as an act of uh, pop and Dada protest. He said, I don't think that pop would have existed without Dada having existed before it, but I don't really think that pop is Dada. I don't think that I look at my work as being anti-art or anything that's different from the mainstream of painting since the Renaissance. So he considered his paintings to be just as fine um, and well thought out as those in the Renaissance. So there is certainly an uh, element of irony and humor in his style. Um, he does have a very classical tradition in the control of his line and shape and color, as well as his compositional elements. So um, the, the subject matter and the way it's painted is different, but kind of following some traditional rules there. Um, he uh, uh, kind of calls this the character of his art. He says, my work sanitizes it emotion that is, but it is also symbolic of commercial art sanitizing people's feelings. I think it can be read that way. People mistake the character of line for the character of art, but it's really the position of line that's important or the position of anything, any contrast, not the character of it. So these artists, Warhol and Lichtenstein, again, very well thought out um, processes of art here, but just very different than what we had seen before. Uh, and this is his sleeping girl. And so comic books uh, were the primary sources for um, Lichtenstein's paintings. Um, uh, again, he imitated the tradition of comic strips um, uh, the, with these Bende dots. Um, these paintings actually brought Lichtenstein mainstream success, uh, but initially he also received uh, quite harsh criticism. He was accused of counterfeiting uh, commercial images and was even called one of the worst artists in America but we will explore that more in our next lecture. Now, there were, of course, um, other uh, artists as well. Um, the first museum survey of pop art uh, was called, uh, the show was called The New Painting of Common Objects. And this was held at the Pasadena Art Museum in 1962. It showcased uh, both Warhol and Lichtenstein, as well as many other pop artists living in Los Angeles. And so we'll take a look at a few of those as well. Uh, but you get this idea that, it, um, it, again, it's all about the, the commercialization of images and taking personal feelings out of it. Yet at the same time, these artists are really putting a quite, you know, their own feeling into this um, to express their thoughts of the day. So Wayne Thiebaud um, is an American painter whose most famous works are of cakes, pastries, boots, toys, and lipstick. Um, he is associated with the pop art movement um, because of um, his interest in mass culture. Um, though a lot of his works kind of predated uh, the more well-known pop artists, he continues to this day to create these cakes and pastries. So he's really kind of stuck with the pop art. Um, he uses heavy pigment and exaggerated colors to depict his subjects and the well-defined shadows um, of advertisements are almost always included in his work. So again, a very traditional uh, way to paint, thinking about the light source, but it's a bubblegum machine. Um, uh, this is Jim Dine's work. In the early 1960s, he began attaching objects, uh, particularly tools that meant a lot to him, to his canvases. 
Uh, this is job number one from 1962. Um, it's in the collection at the Honolulu Museum of Art. And this actually incorporates uh, paint cans, paint brushes, which you can see there in the upper left, um, a screwdriver, a piece of wood, um, and it was really an example of, of his uh, pop artwork. And these actually provided both commercial as well as critical success. But you might actually be more familiar, whoops, get this going forward, um, with Jim Dine's hearts. Uh, so he did all these, the wonderful hearts that you see. So he also um, continued with pop art um, in, in many different ways. And, and again, we kind of see that train of thought that pop art, even today, and we'll see at the end, really continues because we're still using images of, um, of, of commerciality, of you know, commercials and, and, and mass culture, uh, popular culture um, in artwork. So another artist, uh, oops, go back, is James Rosenquist. Um, he started his career uh, painting warehouses and later billboards. Um, he really loved depicting metallic material. Um, uh, the enormous scale of his work and the ways in which his compositions are reminiscent of advertising can be attributed to these past experiences. Um, he would take all these elements and kind of add a little bit, a bit of sex appeal and imagery from popular culture um, and the domestic environment. And you've got really this really quite interesting mix of, um, of ingredients for his paintings here. So he loved the cars uh, and the time. So we see the, the Ford at the top there. I'm pretty sure it's a, yeah, it's a Ford muscle car there. And then in the middle, we kind of almost see that Lichtenstein, you know, male and female reacting in there. And then this, this really amazing, amazing um, uh, painting of spaghetti down below, which is kind of uh, contrast with the hard edges of, of the Ford. But was really just, again, his way to express uh, the kind of art he wanted to do and pop art as well. And this is Clay's Oldenburg. Um, he was also a pop artist who gravitated towards sculpture, uh, much more so than any of his contemporaries. Um, at the start of the 1960s, he was involved in various happenings. Uh, these were spontaneous, um, improvised artistic events um, where the experience of the participants was more important than an end product. So it was kind of a consumer art encounter for a consumer culture. So again, just this whole idea of the, of the consumer. Um, his work is very much full of humorous irony and contradiction. Um, on one hand, he makes hard objects uh, like a bathroom sink out of soft sagging vinyl. While on the other, he makes soft objects like a cheeseburger out of hard painted plaster. And you also see here uh, the scale of his work when you see the, the people behind it. So it was really just kind of amazing what he did too. But again, just talking about this, uh, you know, consumer culture and, and trying to exploit that. And he did another great one. Um, this is actually in Minnesota and he did this with another artist and I'm sorry, I don't have his name there. Um, so he kind of really subverted um, the relative size of objects uh, by taking small items like a spoon and a cherry and recreating them on this really large architectural scale. He said, I like to take a subject and deprive it of its function completely. So by undermining the form, scale and function of an object, uh, Oldenburg contradicts its meanings and forces us to reassess what we think of it and its presence in our lives as well, because now the spoon and cherry are in our face. Um, and when you see, really see these large scale public works and enviro, environmental settings, it, it almost kind of brings about this surrealistic quality. And you see that, that must be awfully fun to see though. Uh, there were also female pop artists, but not as many. Um, Pop artists uh, all over from Andy Warhol were fascinated by Marilyn Monroe. Um, again, as this uh, most famous of movie stars at the time and this kind of epitome of the new sexuality. Um, Bodhi was the one of the very few women artists working in this vein. And this kind of gives her a different view on Marilyn. And we can kind of look at this and say, um, is, is, is the figure being squeezed? by the painting around it? Is it being isolated? Is, again, as though she is um, on display 
for consumer culture just to be picked up and plucked and purchased and brought home. Um, so she was very much concerned with, Bodhi was, with gender and sexuality um, uh, in these, and we can really see that in this, these paintings here. Oh, I'm sorry for the spelling arrow, error on canvas there. Um, I also wanted to show you uh, Yayoi Kusama. Um, uh, she was an avant-garde Japanese artist, or still is, uh, very influential in post-war New York art scene. She staged provocative happenings um, and exhibiting works. Um, she's also very much known for her, uh, for her dots. We'll talk about that in the next slide a little bit. Um, and these physical representations of the idea of infinity. So the floor of this mirrored room was covered with these white blobs, which were covered in red polka dots. And then we see Kusama has posed herself there on the floor in a red bodysuit. Um, and again, this was this was kind of a, for her, um, a, you know, while very commercial because the pop arts again, like the like the comic books things, um, it was a way for her to deal with her acute depression um, and the observations of the repetitiveness of daily life. Um, she actually coined the term obsessional art to describe her work. Um, and, and did this so through with her mental um, it, um, health issues, but was really concerned with the polka dots. And we'll see in this next slide here. So this is one of, uh, we saw the older infinity room there. And this is one of uh, the newer ones. This is, it's been in many different places. Um, I saw it at the Broad up in Los Angeles, where you can go in and you feel as though you are an in infinity. And um, then we see Yayoi over there. I think it was taken a, a few years ago uh, with her wonderful polka dots. Um, and she said about these, our earth is only one polka dot among a million stars in the cosmos. Polka dots are a way to infinity. When we obliterate nature and our bodies with polka dots, we become part of the unity of our environment. So still kind of talking about uh, being part of the environment and, and, and to me still this idea of pop art that's, uh, you know, it's it, very easy to look at and to and to be a part of and to recognize what it is, is really the other thing. It's just pop art is very recognizable because it was part of mass culture. And Yayoi is actually 91 years old and still practicing art. And we'll end here uh, with Jeff Koons. Now, Jeff Koons is a, a contemporary artist and he's actually considered neo-pop. So the new pop artists, um, but as I said, I don't think that pop art really ever left us um, from the 1960s and from what Warhol and Lichtenstein um, originally started with. And, and, and it just continues with, with through different artists and many artists do many other different things as well. But I think pop art will probably always be with us. Um, and it was, pop art really kind of led this very peculiar path of development. Uh, it had a lot of criticism and controversy, um, but it really survived and thrived and became the art movement of the 1960s. Um, art had a renewed impact on the reception of art. And in fact, they might even say a renaissance. And in today's mass or popular culture, um, it is a boom well worth thinking about. As uh, Andy Warhol put it, everything is pop and pop is everything. So I hope you've enjoyed this little look at pop art and I look forward to seeing you um, with the Roy Lichtenstein lecture. Have a great day.